Hey, thanks to Zan and the team. Uh, thanks for all the work you're putting into this worship. It's, it's so appreciated, and we think you're all awesome. Kids, it's your time. We're going to spend some time just continuing our story of Moses today. And uh, remember, last week we were at quite an exciting particular point in his journey through the wilderness. Remember, he had had all the things of coming out of Egypt across the Red Sea. There was no water, and God turned it sweet, bitter water sweet. There was no food. He gave them manna from heaven. And then last week, we find Moses facing his first really big physical army that he had to fight. These were the Amalekites. They were mean guys. They were big. They were strong. They had lots of armaments, and there were thousands of them. And they wanted to fight with Moses. And Moses said, but guys, we, we don't want to fight. We're just on a journey through this wilderness. We know it kind of belongs to you. But God has taken us to a place where we want to go, but they wanted to fight with Moses. And so Moses tried desperately, I'm sure, not to have a fight, but they chose. They picked a fight with Moses. They probably saw that Moses didn't have any fancy soldiers. They didn't have swords. They didn't have shields. They didn't have all that. And the Amalekites would have thought, we've got them. These guys are easy for the taking. They saw they had some stuff that they had taken out of Egypt, and they thought, we want that stuff. So they lined up for a big fight. And Joshua, who was Moses' right-hand man, was, was a younger man, and he, he, he was in charge of the people. And he, Moses said to him, Joshua, choose some people, and you're going to have to fight with the Amalekites, but God will be with you. And so they chose some people, and they went into the battle. While they're fighting, all the people are saying, yo, man, the, we're fighting here, but we see Joshua, but has anybody seen Moses? Where is Moses? He's meant to be here with us in the fight. He's our leader. He's meant to be down here in the valley, and he's meant to be fighting with us. And we go and see him anyway. When all of a sudden, somebody pointed up to the hill on the side of the battlefield and said, Guys, there's Moses, and he's with Aaron, and he's with her, his two close friends. They're not in the battle, but look what he's doing. He's sitting on a rock, and he's got his hands high in the sky. I wonder what he's doing. And suddenly they realized that Moses was praying. And then they noticed that Moses, as he was praying for the people who were fighting in the valley, as you know, they noticed that his hands were getting tired and they would come down. And as his hands came down, all of a sudden the Amalekites began to win the fight. And as he put his hands up and he prayed some more, and they realized, man, there is power in what Moses is doing. And Moses is praying for the people fighting in the valley. They kept their eye on Moses, and they kept thinking, Moses, keep your hands up. And even when his hands were tired, Aaron took one hand and Hur took the other hand, and they held Moses' hands up in the sky while Moses prayed. Hey, boys and girls, you know who won that fight? Mm -hmm. Joshua and his little ragtag army beat the entire Amalekite army. Now we think, wow. Let's give Joshua a big hand, and I think we should. He, he fought bravely, and he fought really well. But I have to tell you, young people, as much as the battle was fought in the valley, it wasn't won there. It was won on the hilltop. You see, the power of Moses' prayer was awesome. Now let me tell you, young people, when we face problems, when we face big challenges in our own lives, don't you think we should do the same thing? I know that sometimes we have to go through like the battle and we have to do all the stuff down here, but we need to look up there and see that there is somebody praying for us. Well, that might be your mom or your dad. That might be your pastor or your youth leader or your Sunday school teacher praying for you. But let me tell you something very special. Jesus is praying for you today. As much as you are on the earth and doing all the things and the sadness and sometimes of the things that happen and the big challenges that come to us, you must always remember that Jesus is sitting there in heaven and he's watching and he's praying for you at school and he's praying for you with your friends. He's praying that you would make good choices. And Jesus, just like Moses was praying, Jesus prays for you. Now we need to know that that's where our real power comes from. 
I hope that we, and parents, if you're watching this and listening to this, please remember as much as it's fought in the battlefield, it's won on the mountain of prayer. Let's commit ourselves to do that. Let's pray ourselves. And then look to see where Jesus is, and you'll see that he too is praying for you. After the battle, it was amazing. They celebrated, couldn't believe that prayer had been so powerful to answer all their problems, and they continued their journey. And God said to Moses, Moses, I'm going to take you to a very special place. It's a big mountain. It's called Mount Sinai. And when you get to this mountain, Moses, I don't want you to go on the mountain. The mountain is holy. Don't touch the mountain. You must put a boundary around this big mountain. And nobody, nobody, Moses, is allowed to go on the mountain. If they do, there's going to be a huge problem. And so Moses found the mountain, and he saw this great big mountain in front of him. And he said to people, people, this is Mount Sinai. Do not go near it. We're going to put stones all the way around. Do not cross the boundary and go up the mountain. And so they did that. And the people sat at the bottom of the mountain. They looked up and said, well, so what? What are we going to do now? Suddenly they saw something incredible happen. A huge cloud, enormous cloud, came down. And it descended and it covered the whole of the mountain. Everywhere else was sunshine, but around the mountain that covered this entire mountain, there was this cloud. But they noticed that through the cloud, there was a fire. And as the cloud blew one way and then the other, they looked and they saw this fire in the middle of the cloud. And they saw, oh my word, God is on the mountain. Do not touch the mountain. But then God said to Moses, Moses, I want you to come up the mountain. And so Moses said, Lord, I'm ready. And so he began to walk towards the mountain. And the people saw Moses, who they loved, and their leader. They saw Moses and said, Moses, Moses, where are you going? He says, God has told me to go up the mountain. They said, Moses, we don't think that's a good idea. We think you should stay with us. Look up there. There's fire on the mountain. There's a cloud. You're going to get lost, and you're going to walk into the fire, and you're going to burn. Moses, we like you. Moses, please stay with us. Don't go onto the mountain. But Moses continued to walk up the mountain. Mm. We'll find out what next step happened next week. See what happened to Moses on the mountain. Boys and girls, learn the lesson. There is so much power in prayer. Now, whenever you go to church, you're going to hear people say that. And you know why they say that? It's because it's absolutely true. All the problems that you face... All the challenges that are in your life, it doesn't matter what they are, the first thing we need to do is pray ourselves and then look up to see that Jesus is praying for you as well. Come, let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful picture. And as much as it was true for Moses, it's true for us as well that you pray for us in the battlefield of life. And as we go through so many ups and downs and ins and outs and rounds abouts and and so many challenges, we're thankful that, that we do not go alone. We have prayer. We have people who pray for us. And we have you, Jesus, who sit at the right hand of the Father and you pray for your children. That's incredible. And so when we look to you, As the one who prays for us, we feel the sense of your presence and we feel the experience of your power. Help us to understand this beautiful truth today. And not to worry, but to pray more and worry less about the things that are going on around. And then you, we know, will come through for us and you will be glorified and we will be blessed. Thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, I want to continue, if it's okay, into our series of uh, interventions. We've been looking at different interventions as we've seen them in the Scriptures. We've covered a few. I have an incredibly good one for you today. I I love this particular character. But let me begin the sermon by by telling you about a story I knew when we we were kids. story of the Pied Piper. You've heard that the city was infested with rats. They found this man, strangely dressed, who played a flute. And whenever he played the flute, the rats would follow him. And so they paid him to, or they were going to pay him, they promised to pay him 
to get rid of the rats of the town if he would just play his flute and walk them into the sea. So he did that. Well, I thought about that in the, in the context of the world in which we live. And we may not have rats, but we certainly still have a rat race, do we not? There are people who are hooked up in this rat race, and it's just a treadmill of life and its busyness, and it's going for this, and its problems there, and it's meeting this there. And we are, may not be rats, but it doesn't mean we're not caught up in the rat race of life. And then all of a sudden, every now and then, in the midst of all these thousands of people who are all journeying on the rat race, suddenly you meet one person, maybe two, who turn around and they seem to be going in the opposite direction. They go against the flow. They go against the normal thinking of the majority of people. And, and I'm intrigued by these kind of people. That even though the masses are going one way, they choose against all the odds to go against the prevailing wisdom and to go in the opposite direction. I'm intrigued with these people. I've met a few people like that. Met a few. History has recorded a whole bunch. But I want to tell you, the Bible has plenty of people. And if you want to be a follower of Christ, there are going to be times when you have to go against the flow. You have to go against the prevailing wisdom of the day in order to be what God wants you to be. Now, there are a number of them. But the one that I've chosen, he's probably one of my favorites, is a man that we find in the Old Testament. His name is Caleb. And Caleb, every time you, you read of him, he's doing the same thing. He's swimming upstream. Every time you read of Caleb, he's going against the flow of the majority of people. The majority say one thing, Caleb says another. And he's not ashamed to be known for that. Now, there are a number of times in the Scriptures where you find Caleb to be mentioned. If you're sitting at home, you can turn in your Bible to Numbers chapter 13. And I want to read to you from verse 26. And it's a, it's a great story, and then we're going to turn to Joshua chapter 14, and then I want to share some thoughts with you. It says this, now Moses had gone into the land of Canaan, uh, sorry, the land of the wilderness, and God had promised that there would be a promised land, the land of Canaan. And so God said to Moses, I need you to cross into that land, but before you go, Joshua said he's going to send some spies to check out the land. So 12 spies went out into the land. Joshua and Caleb were two of the spies, and they came back with an incredible report. It says this, They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account, We went into the land to which you sent us. It does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. Huh. But, the big but, the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. These are giants. The Anakites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and we should take possession of the land. We can certainly do it. Huh. But, here's the other but. The men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, hm, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are as great size. We saw the Nephilim, the descendants of Anna, coming from the Nephilim, we, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. That night, chapter 14, all the people of the community raised their voices, and they wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword. Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us just to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Verse 5, Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, who were among those who had explored the land, they tore their clothes 
And they said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we pass through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, He will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and He will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. They wanted to kill Joshua and Caleb because they had a good report. Now, that's intriguing. But once you turn then to Joshua chapter 14, this is another great place where we read about Caleb. Now they'd gone into the land and they'd crossed the Jordan River and now Joshua was, was allocating territory to the 12 tribes of Israel and he was allocating different places in, in, in the promised land to different people. And it says this, chapter 14, Now then, just as the Lord had promised, this is a Caleb speaking, because Caleb put up his hand and he said, I want to take the hill country, the land of Hebron. And everybody laughed at him and they said, You can't take Hebron. You're 85 years old and there's still giants that live up there. Nobody wanted Hebron at all. And he says this, Now then, just as the Lord has promised. He has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said to Moses while Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses set me out. I'm just as vigorous to go into the battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there, and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helped me. I will drive them out, just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. And then we read a, a little bit later, we read about the fact that God had said of Caleb that Caleb is a man who worships me wholeheartedly. And we say, well, is this not the trick, if there is one. Is this not the truth we need to hold on? Where God said of Caleb, I have found a man who thinks differently. He has a different spirit in him. And he is a one who loves me and serves me with a whole heart. Now, you want to know how Christians go against the flow. Here it is. Here's the key. When we love God like Caleb loved God and want to serve God like Caleb served God, then we have to know that it's a wholehearted deal. God is drawn to people who worship Him wholeheartedly. In verse 24, it says so beautifully, My servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. Now, this different spirit is an intriguing thought. It speaks of a mindset. And when we look at Caleb, we say, hey, Caleb, you're going against the flow of the entire nation except one or two. And, and, and Caleb, well, what's, what's on your mind that you would want to go so, so, are you arrogant? Or where do you come from that you would think so differently to the majority? And I ask, where do we find people like this? What makes people who are willing to go against the flow? Are they just better people? Maybe they're not just better people. Maybe none of us others who are going the other way even try because people who go against the flow are just better people. They have a better DNA. They have a better upbringing. I don't know what it is, but we do know this, that everybody can worship God with a whole heart, and when they do that, it will automatically take them against the flow. Now, we have to ask Caleb, what's on his mind? We're saying to Caleb, what are you thinking about? Because you have a different spirit. We've said this often, have we not, church, that what you think determines what you do. Everything that you do comes from something that you think. You think before you do. And when you look at Caleb, you say, if he did that, what was he thinking? What was on his mind? It's the power of what we think that we need to find out what Caleb had. Now, Romans 12 verse 2 totally gets with this thing. And it says this to us today. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need to take on the mindset of Caleb. The battle is not out there. The battle is in our heads. Now, there are three qualities that I have to share with you today 
that uh, speak about what wholehearted thinking is all about as we see them in the life of Caleb. Here's the first one. Number one, Caleb identified the impossible, but he focused on the invisible. He wasn't a fool. He saw the sons of Anak. He saw the giants in the land. He saw the fortified cities. He was not burying his head in the sand and saying they do not exist. But there was something about Caleb that did not focus on the impossible, but it looked at the invisible. Now, there's a biblical principle. That's biblical to the core. We see so many beautiful examples of this. I particularly love the one in 2 Kings 6 with Elisha. And he's surrounded by the armies of Ahab. And he says to the servant, greater is he who's with us than he who's outside the city wall. And he asks God to open his servant's spiritual eyes. And suddenly the servant's eyes are open. He sees the armies of heaven. He sees the chariots. He sees the angels. And he says to Elisha, oh, Elisha, now I know why you are not worried. is because you can see something that to the rest of us is invisible. We can't see that. And because you can You have this great confidence to go against the flow because you can see the invisible. Acts chapter 7, we have Stephen who's being stoned to death for his faith. And as the stones are taking the life out of his body, it says this. It says he looked up to heaven and he saw Jesus. (laughs) He saw Jesus. He saw what to everybody else was invisible. People, when we see the invisible or we perceive with our spiritual eyes the the reality of the invisible, we will never be the same again. Hebrews 11, 27 talks about people of faith. It says as they see him who is invisible. They see the invisible. I wonder how true that is in life and in our approach toward death. In my job, I have the privilege of sitting at the bedside of people who are leaving this life to go to the next. And there have been occasions where I have just been so blown away and intrigued by people who are moving from this life to the next. In those last moments of their life, I'm convinced they're able to see the invisible. My own dad-in-law, Eugene, who was pastor here, many of you knew and loved Eugene, and Helene was with him when he passed away. And we watched this man, and Aline came back and said in the last moments of his life, he was reaching out. His hands were going up into the air. As he began to reach out just prior to his spirit leaving his body, his hands were reaching out to something we couldn't see. But we look at him, and we say, he can see something. He can see the invisible. And his hands were reaching and trying to grab towards this thing just moments before he died. I remember sitting at the bedside of another man who had a similar experience, but he was coherent. And he was able to talk to me, and I would say to him, Uncle Charlie, what can you see? And he would say, hey, Trevor, I can see angels. <laughs> I see angels. And some people are going to say, it's just his medication. I don't think so. No medication here. He could see angels. And he was lying there in his last moments, and he would say, wow, look at that one. Oh, my word, look at that one. Oh, there it is. And, and then his spirit left his body at total peace. Because he saw the invisible. He saw the invisible. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says this, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. I'm intrigued by that. I see it. I don't always understand it. It's a mystery. But I wonder if there's a lot more truth in that particular scenario. The Apostle Paul probably had a similar experience. Last letter of his life, he's writing to two Timoth- to Timothy, his little protege. He says to Timothy, the last statements, I've fought the fight, I've kept the faith, I've run the race. Henceforth, Timothy, Timothy, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, is going to give me on that day. On that day. He says, I know it's there. There's a crown. I just can't see it right now. But I know that it's there. Right now, it's invisible. But on that day, that which was once invisible will become visible, and it will be mine. This could revolutionize your spiritual life, people. In 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Now while we live this life, we see through a glass darkly. But on that day, we will see face to face, 
that which was once invisible has now become visible. How cool is that? Here's another aspect very quickly. Ephesians 2 verse 14 says this, For we are God's workmanship in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's intriguing that God has prepared in advance works for you and me to do. Not only has he prepared the works, but he's prepared the resources and the stuff that we need in order to be able to do the work that he has prepared us to do. He's done it in advance. That means that God is already in my future. He doesn't have to wait for me to get there, to be there. He's already in my future. And he has stored up the wherewithal that I need in order to be able to fulfill that which he has called me to do. People, listen, if we were to just to stop the sermon right here, I'm going to tell you, we have enough now to know how to change our lives. Caleb, in Numbers 13, he, he, he turned bad news into a good report. That's what Christians should be doing. Oh, listen, man, there's so much bad news around right now. <laughs> I just can't wait to find a person who sees bad news, but he still gives a good report. You want to give a good report like they did. Joshua and Caleb gave a great report about the land. They said, you're right, there are giants there, and they are huge. But that's the bad news. The good report is that God is with us, and he is able, we are able to take the land despite what you see in your visible eye because the invisible God is with us. When you get this truth, people, bad news doesn't need to stay there. Bad news can always be a good report because of the power of the invisible with you. That's the first thing. The second thing, Caleb re resisted the impetuous, but he acted on the imperative. Impetuousness and imperativeness. He understood these things. Acting on the impetuous, you all know, can get you into trouble. You know, people pay a, lot of, a big price where they are impetuous and make decisions bad choices out of a wrong motive, wrong emotion. Judges chapter 11 has a terrible story. A guy by the name of Jephthah, one of the judges, he took his army to fight the Ammonites, and before he fought them, he made a vow. He says, if you will give me victory, O God, over the Ammonites, I will get home, and the first thing that comes out of the front door of my house, I will sacrifice to you. I'm not sure what he was hoping was going to come out, but that was his very silly, impetuous vow. He won the battle. He went back home, and as he got back home, his young daughter came dancing out of the house, and he realized, what a stupid thing. Why did I make that stupid vow? Why did I make it? Well, I don't know whether he fulfilled it, but, a, but what a stupid, impetuous thing to do. Impetuous things generally happen in a fit of emotion. You know, there are four emotions we talk about. Impetuousness comes because you're too happy or you're too glad. Impetuous choices come because you feel too bad or too mad or too sad. Out of those four emotions, when they get to an extreme and you make some kind of choice, I guarantee it's going to be an impetuous one. When you feel happy, if you feel too happy, you're going to make the stupidest promises to people around you. And when you come back to earth again, you're going to think, why did I say that? I was so happy at the time and I felt so good and so high that I made this commitment to this person and now I have to live it out. And many people don't because they make an impetuous promise at the point of being excessively happy. Some people are excessively sad and they make stupid decisions or impetuous decisions to do some of the most tragic of things because of the excessive sadness that they may feel. Peter the impetuous one amongst the disciples made a few categorically impetuous statements. I'll die for you, Jesus. I'll die for you. Yeah, right. A little while later, he's running with all the other disciples. He had a little bit of an attempt. And then he's denying Jesus and everything that he said in a moment of high emotion now became crashing around him as an impetuous promise. Let me give you a little bit of advice and I'll stop here. That I need to encourage you to avoid making decisions when you are excessively glad, mad, sad, or feeling bad. Fight that emotion. Don't make a decision, life-changing decision, when you're feeling excessive in any of those four areas. Here's the key. 
we've got to manage our emotions better. And the way that we manage our emotions, if those can cause us to make impetuous decisions, is to match your emotion with personal experience or the experience of other people. It means you've got to sit back and think for a bit. You've got to take your emotion. I want to take nothing away from emotion. I'm an emotional person, you know, but I, I've got to weigh up that emotion against personal experience or maybe story of somebody else. Moses is a great example, and we've been doing Moses in our kids' things. Where Moses, as he journeyed through life, at first he had never seen this before, a God who could open the Red Sea. And he gets across the other side, and suddenly he sees a God who could turn bitter water sweet. And he's beginning to say, hey, man, I'm becoming a little bit familiar with the ways of God. I've seen this before. And then when manna came, he's building up his confidence, and he's saying, man, I've seen this before. And then when he fights the Amalekites, as we, we spoke to about today, you know, he, he's, got, he's got confidence there because he's seen this before, and his emotions are now being backed up by that which he's seen in practice and in experience, and now he can make a decent, ex, decent decision that is not just some impetuous movement because I feel like something. I've seen this before, but be very careful. Be very careful, because when you become overly familiar to the I've seen it before thing, you end up again like Moses, who, who struck the rock. The water came out. The next time there was no water, God said to Moses, I want you to speak to the rock. And Moses said, oh, I've seen this before. <laughs> I've done this before. Lord, you, you told me to hit the rock, rock last time. I know you told me to t speak to the rock this time. But last time it really worked well, and I got quite a lot of credit, and the people applauded me. So, Lord, I hope you don't mind, but I'm just going to hit the rock, and, and, and I know you'll probably come through for me. And God said, Moses, don't do that. Moses, don't do that. Do what I've told you to do. Don't do the impetuous thing. Don't do the thing because you've seen it before and it worked before, doesn't this? And Moses hit the rock twice. Oh, God honored it by giving him water for the people. But Moses lost his blessing because he touched the glory of God. And you don't want to touch the glory of God. And he messed up because of familiarity. I want you to notice too that uh, there's a difference between, between spontaneous and, and impetuous. Impetuousness is actions that come out of a fit of high emotion, as we said just now. I feel mad, glad, sad, or bad. And those will lead me to impetuous choices. But when I add experience to that, all of a sudden I'm looking at the facts and not so much the feelings. Here's a great example. There's that young kid who watches as Jesus teaches the crowds. And Jesus calls his disciples and says, hey guys, these people are hungry. You need to feed them. And they said, we don't have any food. And this kid, in an act of beautiful spontaneity, it wasn't impetuous. He wasn't going to get anything out of this. It wasn't out of a fit of emotion, glad, bad, sad. He, he gave because he saw a need. And Jesus said to the disciples, here's the facts, disciples. These people haven't eaten for days. And the kid's watching and say, that's a fact. That's a fact. And I can act spontaneously because I know the facts and I'm not just living out of my feelings. And as he acts out of the facts, he does the most beautiful, spontaneous thing. And he says, hey, Jesus, I know it's not much. I know it's only a little bit. But I've got a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Jesus, if this is of any use to you, and Jesus says, that'll do it. That act of beautiful spontaneity, not because of a feeling, but because he saw the facts as they were set out before him. That is beautiful. And I don't think we do that enough. I don't think we do that enough. The other aspect of this is he focused on the imperative. He focuses not just on the but the, he doesn't do the impetuous, but he focuses on the, the imperative. People, there are some things that are imperative in our Christian lives. You want to know what's imperative? Ask the prophet Amos. Amos chapter 7. Amos is talking about truth, and he uses a plumb line as an object lesson. And he says to people, if I have a plumb line here, yeah, check it out, and I can swing that plumb line from one side to the other, but over the course of a little bit of time, what happens to the plumb line? It comes back to dead center, and it will be absolutely right. He says that's like truth. There are some fundamental truths, people, that are imperative to your faith. They're not optional. They're imperative. And these imperative things, things like, you know, it's, it's imperative that you build your life upon a strong foundation. 
Don't build on the sand, build upon a rock. It's imperative that you learn to take up your cross and follow Jesus. It's not a one-off event. It's imperative that you learn to live by faith. It's imperative that you understand the need for fellowship. It's imperative that you understand your function to be holy and to love God and to serve people. Those are imperatives in our faith. But here we see a beautiful focus of Caleb, and his imperative here was the glory of God. He says, it's beautiful, if you continue reading that story, chapter 14 from verse 10 onwards, he, God gets angry with the people because they won't go into the promised land as the spies, Joshua and Caleb had said. And God says to Moses, Joshua and Caleb, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm not going to take them with me. I'm going to leave them. And Joshua and Caleb and Moses, they say to God, they say, God, you can't do that because your glory is going to be in, inhibited here. And what are we going to tell the Egyptians? And what are the Egyptians going to say when they, they say to us, hey, but your God said he was going to take you to a land of milk and honey. You know, honey, you got there. What are the Egyptians going to say, Lord, your glory is at stake and your name and your promise is associated with your glory. Lord, please rethink this thing through. And God did because God knew his glory was at stake. They would have said, God, you've never, ever failed. There's never been a promise you have not fulfilled. Your glory is at stake, and Caleb knew that. People, God's glory is at stake in your lives. You know what the greatest enemy of imperative is? It's impressive. I love impressive stuff. I don't know about you. But being something or seeing something that is impressive can take my eyes off that which is imperative. Is Elijah. It was imperative that he called down fire from heaven. Called down fire from heaven and that killed the prophets of Baal. Imperative because the glory of God hinged on that. He now goes into a period of real depression. He runs off and it's imperative that God restore Elijah. So he says to Elijah, Elijah, you know, here's some food and I want you to go up to a, a mountain. I'm going to meet you there and I will speak with you on the mountain. It was imperative, absolutely imperative, that Elijah heard the voice of God at this particular point. So he makes his way to the mountain, and God meets him there. At first, it was, Elijah wasn't quite sure what to expect, but a, a, a great wind began to grow, blow across, and it was impressive, man. It was blowing boulders down the mountain. And, and Elijah must have thought, wow, God is in the wind. We, he's like the wind, and he's blowing. God is powerful, but God was not in the impressive and then a fire came across the mountain, a huge fire. And Elijah could not be faulted for saying, or you know, feel bad because he, he felt that God might be in the fire, but God was not in the impressive fire either. There was earthquakes, but God was not in the impressive. His imperative was he hear from God through a still, small voice. People don't look for God in the impressive. The impressive is nice when we see it. But it's not necessary. It is imperative that we learn to trust God without being distracted by that which would be considered to be impressive. The third thing about Caleb. Caleb avoided the temptation to indifference and responded to the call to be an instrument. He's 85 years old. <laughs> Most people at 85 we're going for knee replacements and sitting in old age homes, wanting to make best to play golf or go fishing. Here's Caleb, 85 years old, and he's saying, give me the hill country. I'll climb those hills. I'll beat up the, the armies of Anak, and I will take Hebron. I will take the hill country because the same God who was with me back then is the same God who's with me now. And I can do it not because I'm powerful, but I know a powerful God is able to do it through me. I just have to be obedient. And he could have been indifferent. He could have said, hey, guys, I'm 85 years old now. I don't have long to go. Chances are I've only got maybe 10, 15 years at the most. I'm just going to chill. Let the next generation handle this thing. Let them take Hebron. Let them take it, and, and I'm just going to chill and be comfortable. And he never did that. He never did that. He continued to say, what is my next purpose? I have to be an instrument to the very end in the hand of a living God. 
I will avoid indifference by continuing to be an instrument of use in God's hands. You see, indifference says, it's not my problem. Let the next generation do this. Indifference says, it's not my, it's not my fault. Not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. Therefore, let them sort out their own problems. And we see this, this clash of his mindset against the general mindset of the world today, people. And I'm anti it. This thinking I can just retire and drive and blow away. Your best years should be your last years. And your last years should be your best years as you give back to people, as you pour back into the next generation, as you stop being grumpy and territorial, and as you give back to people. Man, your best years are yet to come according to this. 85 years old and he's taking the hill country. The Bible is full of Caleb-spirited people, people like Nehemiah. Why did Nehemiah care? He's living in Persia. Got a super job. You know, he's a cupbearer of the king, living in comfort and everything. And yet he cared enough to drive his camels across the wilderness and, and, and go and help the, the people in Jerusalem. Why do you do that? He had a Caleb spirit. Why did Esther, queen of the land, she could have lived comfortably and strawberries and cream at Wimbledon. She could have done all of that amazing stuff. But she chose, if I perish, I perish, I will cross the line. For such a time as this, I'm in this place. And she, she, she didn't fall for the temptation to be in, indifferent. I love those kind of people. I love Patch Adams. Patch Adams in his movie, classic line of Patch Adams. When he's standing before the panel and he says, gentlemen, indifference is the greatest disease of the soul. Think about that. Your soul is sick, can be sick because of indifference. Indifference is the greatest disease of the soul. Let me tell you this too. I heard this. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is simply indifference. That's why Jesus told great stories about stuff like this. Tell the story of the Good Samaritan and the elder and the minister of the church and the people from the synagogue who came. They walked past. They were indifferent to the need of one of their own people. And along comes a Samaritan who should not have liked that person, didn't like him, came from a different nation, from a different faith. And he, and he was the one who put aside indifference to become involved, to be an instrument to help that man in the gutter. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? Jesus looked down at a sin-sick world, and he could have said to the Lord God, his Father, he said, Hey, God, Father, it's, it's a mess down there. Why don't we just snuff it out and start again? But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. He came as an instrument of salvation for the purpose of the glory of God. I love another thing quickly about Caleb. Caleb didn't stop in Hebron, you know that. If you read chapter 15 from verse 13 to 19, I haven't got time to read it now, you read how he didn't stop in Hebron. He went on to another area called Debai, Debo, and he, he went and he captured that as well. And he gave to his daughter a portion of ground there. He didn't stop. He would have thought after 85 and he's captured Hebron, got rid of the giants, he would have said, okay, now it's time to park off. He didn't stop. He didn't stop to park off. He said, where's the next one? And he's still fighting giants right to the end of his life. He wasn't indifferent, but he wanted to be an instrument in the hands of God. There's a beautiful song, I think that says it all. It's called Instrument of Peace. Listen to the words as it's sung to you right now, and then I just have one concluding comment. Listen to the song. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Walls of pride and prejudice shall we 
Folks, thank you for hearing me out today, but I do just have two quick comments. I think the key to this whole thing is being the wholehearted follower of Jesus. God is a way of avoiding half-hearted people, hard-hearted people, calloused-hearted people. And I hope that maybe as you this Sunday morning have heard this sermon, that maybe you'll sit for a little while and contemplate the state of your heart. Make sure that you serve God with a whole heart. And then the reason that I, I, I chose Caleb is because I find his story to be just so incredibly inspirational. But I do know, too, that it can be very intimidating because you might be thinking that I'm saying everybody needs to go and do what he did. No, I don't think you do need to do that. But I do think you do need to do this. I do think you need to be Caleb in the environment in which you live. I do think that you need to portray these values in the area that you serve, the area that you work in your family. You may not go off and take out giants and capture hill countries, but that does not mean and does not give us an excuse not to be a Caleb-spirited person where you are. So I really hope that you may just listen to these principles, apply them, and be a blessing to the world around you. But thanks for joining us today, guys. I hope you have a fantastic week, and I look forward to meeting you next week again and sneaking into your home for this hour and a bit. Uh, but Lizzie and her team are going to lead you in some beautiful worship. Why don't you join with them today? Thank you.